Those who have grown up in the church know the story of Abraham and how God called him to go to the land of Canaan. God promised him that he would make him a great nation, that through one of his offspring the world would be blessed, and that he would give Abraham a land to be his possession and the possession of his descendants. Abraham had a long, hard road through this life. And as the author of Hebrews tells us, Abraham and those in his household all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Yet what is often not known to most people is that it is possible, maybe even likely, that Abraham's father, Terah, received the call from God first, but did not follow through. We find that in Genesis 11. After the story of Babel, there is a genealogy taking us to Abraham. Now, let's be honest, we often skip genealogies, because to us, they're just a bunch of names. Yet in this case, if we do, we miss 1131. Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Interesting that Terah set out for Canaan. Why would he do that? It's possible, maybe even likely, that he was called by God first to go, perhaps even given promises. Yet Terah got sidetracked in Haran. He settled down there. Why did he do that? Well, we can only speculate, but perhaps it's because he didn't see himself as a stranger and exile on earth as the author of Hebrews says about Abraham. If he saw this world as his home, then if he arrived at a place that seemed good, lush, pleasant, like everything he wanted, he might settle down there. Yet Abraham kept going. God called him to continue the journey in Genesis 12, and he did. Whatever the motivation behind Terah's settling down, Abraham acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. So he kept walking the road that God had called him to walk, trusting that God would fulfill his promises one day. Even while in the land of Canaan, he could never really settle down. In fact, the only land he owned was a cave for a tomb for Sarah. But he didn't grow weary of the road. He trusted that one day he would find the better country, that is, a heavenly one, that Hebrews 11.16 tells us he was really seeking. The story of Abraham is a true story. He really left his home, family, and all the familiar things to follow God's road, not knowing where he was going and living the life of a pilgrim in the land of promise, as in a foreign land living in tents. Yet it's also kind of a model or picture of every Christian's journey through life in this world. In a sense, we're all on a journey, on the road. Even if we stay put physically, we are going somewhere every day in life. We're seeking a place where we can find joy, love, delight, refuge, security, and most of all, rest. Yet the more we travel the road of life, we often experience so many disappointments that we start to feel like perhaps there is no such place. Maybe all we can do is settle down somewhere and make the best of it. Perhaps that is what Tara was thinking after the long journey from Ur to Haran. There is no rest after all, so I guess I'll just stay here, for this is about as good of a home as I'm going to find. But even that is not really satisfying, and I imagine that Tara lived the remainder of his 205 years feeling very restless. How can we find the confidence to keep going on the road of life? even though we keep being disappointed by the things of this life. How did Abraham do it? Psalm 16 helps us with that. This is a psalm of orientation, which means it's our chorus when things are going well and the goodness of God is evident. It's also a psalm of confidence, which means David's using it to tell us what is true about God 
in this life. In particular, this psalm shows us how we maintain the confidence to stay on the road of life, like Abraham. It's our course, praising God for his goodness that keeps us on the road and giving us the hope to keep going. The last verse really sums up the whole psalm for us. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David shows us how to get there in this psalm. So let's just work our way through it. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. There are many good things about this life. Family, marriage, children, career, friendship, home, books, travel, church, baseball. The list could go on. We should be thankful for those things and enjoy them. But David is reminding us that there is only one source of all good things. They are all good gifts from a good God. He is actually our only good, not any of the gifts themselves. Last year, my wife gave me a friend's Lego set, which is one of the better gifts that I have ever gotten. Yet what makes it so wonderful isn't the Legos themselves, putting them together, or even the fact that it is a set of Central Perk. It's that it comes from my wife and speaks to one of the whimsical connections that we have. We've enjoyed the show together, watching it who knows how many times. We can quote friends to each other or send each other a friend's gift via text for almost any occasion and make one another laugh. We can play friends seen it as a team and dominate just about any other individual or couple. And yes, if you'd like to challenge that, bring it on. All that history and connection is behind this gift, which is what makes it so good. If I tried to enjoy the gift apart from the giver, my wife, it would soon become boring and cease to satisfy me. The good things of this life are like that. If we try to find our joy in the things themselves or see them as good things by themselves, they may satisfy for a little while, but ultimately they'll disappoint us. And if we try something else, it will disappoint us as well. So many people have ruined their marriages by thinking that marriage will make them happy. They think that if they just find the right person, they'll have a good marriage and live a happily ever after. Yet after years of trying to get joy from their spouse, they find it's like trying to get water from a rock, conclude that marriage has failed them somehow, get divorced, and start over. After a few cycles of that, they eventually conclude that there's just something wrong with marriage itself. It must not be as good as they thought. But the problem isn't marriage. The problem is that they're trying to find their good in the marriage itself instead of seeing it as a gift from a good God who alone can truly satisfy us. God alone is our good. And understanding that, reminding ourselves of that, thinking about that every time we find joy in something in this world gives us the confidence to stay on the road. If we forget that all good comes from him and is meant to lead us back to his goodness, we'll start to think that it, any good that seems to satisfy, may be a pretty good place to settle down, like Tara may have thought about Haran. Yet when we try to settle down there, eventually it will disappoint us. And then what? We try something else and it disappoints. As David says in verse 4, the sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Eventually, we get disappointed so many times that we give up and think wherever we settle is the best we can do. But if we find our good in God and see him as our only good, as David says, we'll find the confidence to keep going like Abraham. We see this in Abraham's life when he's willing to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac was a good gift, even the fulfillment of the promises of God. And God knew Isaac could derail Abraham's journey. So God tested Abraham. And since Abraham knew he had no good apart from God, he trusted the giver of the gift more 
than the gift itself. He was even willing to give it up. Unlike Terra, he knew he was a stranger in exile on earth and wouldn't settle for any earthly good, even Isaac. You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Yet David has more to teach us. The chorus of this psalm continues to speak to us and for us. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Remembering and seeing that God alone is our good helps keep us on the road. But to have the confidence to stay on the road and not just settle down like Terah, we also need a destination to look forward to. Where are we going? Are we on the road for the sake of the road itself? Is a good life its own reward? In Jack Kerouac's novel entitled, well, On the Road, a Nebraska farmer asks the main characters, You boys going to get somewhere or just going? The narrator continues, We didn't understand the question, and it was a good question. He added an extra word in there for emphasis, but we don't need that. It's a good question, because if we're just going, we won't have the confidence to keep on the road of the Christian life for long. If we don't have a destination that we look forward to, we'll settle down somewhere along the way, like Tara did in Haran, and give up the Christian life. David is telling us what Abraham learned as well, which kept him going. God himself is what we look forward to. And being with him is an inheritance that he has for us and keeps secure. He is the possession that Abraham really wanted. When David says that God is our portion or our cup, he's referring to the Old Testament idea of assigned land and food. When the tribes divided up the land of Canaan, each tribe got a portion. It was theirs, their inheritance. And when the Old Testament tithes of food and money were brought to God, the priests and the Levites got a portion of that, which is how they lived. David is using this idea to tell us that on the road and at the end of the journey, God himself is our portion. We're not just going. We're seeking an inheritance that he has for us where we'll be with him and he'll be everything we need, our portion, our cup. Abraham may not have known as much about it as David did or as we do, but he trusted that he was heading somewhere where he'd be with God himself. In fact, he knew that it really wasn't the land of Canaan that was his destination. The land of Canaan was just a symbol of his true destination. Hebrews 11.10 tells us that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And again in verse 16, he tells us they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly country. One. What keeps us on the road is knowing that no destination in this life is really what we look forward to. Our families, careers, marriages, success, wealth, changing our society, retirement, etc., they're all good things. But they are like rest stops, restaurants, or hotels on the road. They're not the destination, but are merely good things that God has given us to help us on the journey. This is where the road of the Christian life is headed. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. That's the heavenly country to which Abraham looked. Life with God in a new creation where no sin, no pain, no suffering is where we are headed. We need to know that is our destiny, our final destination, or else we'll settle down like Terah and not keep going like Abraham. We'll try to make this world our home, our destination, 
and try to find our joy and rest here, which will only fill us with disappointments, bitterness, anger, and eventually despair. Nothing will ever be good enough. In fact, if we really want to be of use to this world and in this life, we need to stay on the road and always be looking forward to our final destination. Only those looking forward to heaven will really be of true earthly good. That sounds paradoxical, but it isn't. C.S. Lewis writes about this in Mere Christianity. Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that our continually looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It doesn't mean that we ought to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for this present world were those who thought most about the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven, and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. It seems a strange rule, but something like it can be seen at work in other matters. Health is a great blessing, but the moment you make health one of your main direct objects, you start becoming a crank and imagining there is something wrong with you. You are only likely to get health, provided you want other things more. Food, games, work, fun, open air. In the same way, we shall never save civilization as long as civilization is our main object. We must learn to want something else even more. Abraham was useful to God and made an incalculable impact on the history of redemption only because he kept going as he looked forward to a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Terah took his eyes off the destination, settled down, and faded into obscurity and uselessness. David has one more piece of the confidence that keeps us going on the road. In verses 7 and 8, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. The final point in the triangle of confidence is knowing that God gives us the counsel we need to live in this world in the best way possible. He doesn't leave us without instruction for living on the road. We're not going to dwell on this for very long, but this is God's word, the Bible. This is why David says just a few psalms later in 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It's why Paul says in Romans 12, too, at the very beginning of his Christian living section in Romans, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. To put it bluntly and simply, we need to pay more attention and give more time to God's counsel in his word than the world around us. Certainly, we can learn from the world, but when it comes to the road of the Christian life, God's word alone gives us the confidence and instruction we need to walk it. It keeps us from being shaken, as David puts it. And the ideologies of this world will only distract us or derail us. So learn from the world where it can teach us, yes. Just do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind through God's word. Let it be your guide on the road, not anyone else in this life. Yet what happens next? Where does this lead us? David tells us, When we know God is our only good, know God is our destiny, and we know God is our counsel, this confidence naturally follows. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. That's confidence. And it's right there that this psalm points us to Jesus. You may remember in the very first lesson on the psalms, 
I said that I believe that all the Psalms are messianic. That is, they all point us to Jesus somehow. Yet some Psalms are more clearly messianic than others. This is one of those Psalms. In fact, it is used by both Peter and Paul in the New Testament to point us to the resurrection of Jesus. It's the second part of verse 10 that gets us there. David and any Old Testament saint could confidently say God would not abandon their soul to the grave. But none of them could really say that their bodies wouldn't see decay or corruption. As Peter says about this psalm, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And it is the resurrection of Jesus that fortifies our three points of the triangle of confidence. As Paul says in Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What are those all things? The all things of Romans 8.28, where God says that he works all things for our good, since he is our good. Since Jesus died and was raised, we can be confident that we can have no good apart from God. If he wasn't raised, we couldn't say that with any certainty. But he was raised, so we can. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That is, Jesus' resurrection is the certain hope of ours. Our portion of God and inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth is secure because Jesus was raised as the first of many, all believers. And Jesus' resurrection confirms that we can trust all God says in his word. Everything in the Bible hangs on the death and resurrection of Jesus. If it had never happened, then God's word would be no better for us than Aesop's fables. But since it did happen, which we can verify in history, we can trust God's counsel and instruction in this life. All that is why Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. That's just a better way of saying that we can have confidence to keep going on the road like Abraham, that it is not in vain. So you all think about that. Next week, Psalm 22. Amen.